We are in turbulent times. Muslims today find themselves floating adrift amidst the crashing waves of modernity. Living in an ever increasingly hostile political climate, coupled with the rise of individualism, freedom and liberalism, how do Muslims today find their spiritual anchorage? Joining us today is Dr. Samir Mahmoud, Academic Director of Asul Academy and a lecturer at the Cambridge Muslim College in Islamic Studies and Islamic Psychology. Dr. Samir, welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Doctor, let's get started straight into this conversation. And for many of our viewers, the word postmodernism, it might be an unfamiliar term. So in simple terms, how would you define postmodernism? What is it? I mean, essentially, postmodernism is postmodern. Mm -hmm. right? So after modern. Um, in order to understand postmodernism, one has to understand what modernism actually was. So if we go back a little bit in history, just uh, um, a bit, bit of a historical um, uh, dimension to it. Uh, around 17th, 18th century, uh, Europeans, for various reasons, um, experienced a fundamental cultural, philosophical, social, economic, political shifts away from the um, certainties of the past and into a world governed by, largely governed by reason, mm -hmm. by rationality. So in the realm of philosophy, there was a shift away from the truths of revelation towards the truths of pure reason. Um, in the realm of culture, there was a shift away from a reliance on the institutions of the church and the uh, meaningful relationships established by those kind of traditional relationships of family and guild and trade, etc., to more rationalized um, bureaucratic structures of the modern nation state. Mm -hmm. In economy, there was a, a shift towards more rational governed economic policies rooted increasingly in um, uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, uh, religion, obviously, the uh, move away from revelation uh, in favor of um, human reason, away from God in favor of the human being. Mm -hmm. So this ushered in that period of modernity or modernism, as it's, it's become known, um, with which kind of uh, initiated a radical break with the past, complete break with the past. Uh, almost as if the European decided they wanted to turn a new page in history by founding their culture, civilization, the sense of meaning, sense of purpose, sense mm -hmm. of morality on new foundations rooted in the human being mm -hmm. um, and rooted in um, the faculty within the human being we call reason. So mm -hmm. detached from God mm -hmm. above, detached from tradition from the past, um, the Europeans embarked on this grand cultural uh, project. Um, by the 20th century, this project of um, basing civilization, basing human existence, are uh, exclusively on human reason, detached from the past, detached from tradition, detached from the moral certainties of um, uh, religious revelation, uh, detached from God, proved to be a fundamental failure, mm -hmm. major failure. And um, in the wake of this breakdown in uh, this grand project and grand narrative, partly triggered by global wars. I mean, the idea, the argument was in the 60s, 50s and 60s was if Europe, Europe had achieved such a, a peak of human civilization rooted in humanism or rooted in the human being and rooted in human reason, how was it that they could um, embark on such catastrophic horrors, World War I, World War II? So there was a serious moment in the European history of a moment of self-doubt. Um, and that ushered in a period of questioning. So the 60s, the hippies revolution, mm -hmm. that entire period, their resistance against war in Vietnam, mm -hmm. all this, and then, and then also the, the student movements in France, all these were various, um, let's say, resistance or um, uh, reactions against that kind of certainty of the modern project. And in its wake, postmodernism was born. Right? Postmodernism is what? If modernism exclusively relied on human reason as a means for understanding the nature and fabric of reality, which is embodied in science, um, and if modernism believed in the absolute certainties of uh, the human being uh, um, and the integrity of the human being, 
um, as someone or entity cut off from revelation, cut off from God, mm-hmm. then postmodernism, and, and, and if modernism um, believed in a complete radical break with the past, postmodernism provided a number of cracks in those kind of um, perspectives or that wall of certainty, um, opening up the possibility of exploring um, uh, post truths. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, if the absolute certainty of human reason was incorrect, then maybe there's no reason. Mm-hmm. There um, are no but maybe there's no truth. I guess it is really that breakaway from objective truth to subjective absolutely. truth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one can define postmodernism as the rejection of truth with a capital T, mm-hmm. the acceptance of multiple truths, and the rejection of moral certainty, you know, objective standards for what is right and wrong, in favor of moral relativism. Um, the utter and complete rejection of objective standards of beauty um, and acceptance of subjectivity of beauty. And this is all as a result of um, the increasing uh, s- centering of human thought and action on the individual. Mm-hmm. This tends to birth of individualism. Because yeah. when you empty out uh, the uh, previous social, cultural, institutional functions performed by traditional societies, um, and uh, you increasingly transfer that function and authority to the state. And when, if you define liberation and emancipation from religion and God uh, to be um, uh, rooted in severing that relationship between with religion and God, what you end up doing is uh, you, you define the true essence of what it means to be a human being as to be an individual who grows and defines themselves on their own terms, independent of any external authority, whether that's God, whether that's tradition, whether that's culture, or in the tradition of someone like Rousseau, society itself. And so what happens with this individual? Individual becomes inflated and inflated and inflated and inflated because you're you're, you're putting greater emphasis on the capacity of the individual to self-define what meaning is, what purpose is, what is true, what is right, what is wrong, what is beautiful. Hence the birth of individualism. I think you've touched on a lot of uh, topics there, Dr. Samir. I think I personally find it hard as being a host and to navigate this conversation and also those of just trying mm. to get my pen there's and paper lot, and scribing a lot, a lot of this right down. Here. But I think you have touched on a lot of things. And as Kamal was saying, it's also very important to define these terms that we talk about in the conversation that we intend to have. Um, but uh, alongside Kamal's question, I would ask you, you talk about individualism and you also talk about the self I think it is also important to identify what is what is this, what is the fitra what is what is the nafs are they two separate things I think often today we also get them conflated with with one another like a corporeal kind of thing so Doctor Smith if I could ask you on a surface level mm. um, what is the ruh what is the, what is the nafs what is fitra because we are not born sages right mm. I mean we know that every child that is born from their mother is uh, born on fitra. And our fitra is distinctive from the trees and from the rivers and mm-hmm. from the animals, I guess. Uh, but mm-hmm. what what is fitra? What Three is the terms. Nafs? Yeah, the ruh, the nafs, and the fitra. Well, I mean, the ruh, nafs, and fitra <laughs> define what it means to be human, mm-hmm. right? So, in in the Islamic tradition, at least, we, uh, when the, uh, um, the Jewish community asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, "What is ruh?" The response came, "Ruh min amr." Right. So it's it's a matter of thy Lord, which human beings have little knowledge of. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't have any knowledge of it. In classical Islamic psychology, in classical Islamic thought, um, the uh, the way the human being was understood is in the following terms. The ruh as a pure ethereal substance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, descends um, into um, the womb. Into Once the ruh becomes manifest in a body mm-hmm. and it's wedded to the Psychosomatic functions of the body and human being. Psychosomatic. Sorry, Dr. Yeah, Smith, we, I think you lost me that word. You may have to break that down a little so, bit for me. Somatic myself. is the bodily. The mm-hmm. bodily, right. And psychic, psycho or psychic is the psychological uh, constitution. Once the ruh becomes embodied in a concrete body, yeah. mm-hmm. um, it's now called nafs. Okay. Right? Coming so the back ruh, to the hadith, فيه الروح, the angel blows into the ruh. At 40 days yes. into the body. So when, yes. once we have that connection, yeah. comes the next. Yeah. Once it's blown in, mm-hmm. the ruh, insofar as it is manifest in a body, is yeah. referred to as the nafs. Right? So we have a body, we have a nafs, mm-hmm. we have a ruh. Um, ruh in a body 
is called nafs. Mm -hmm. That's why in most psychology, in most um, um, psychotherapeutics, in most um, uh, the literature on well-being and, and therapeutics of the soul in the Islamic tradition, or the nafs, um, they talk about the nafs. They don't talk about the ruh much, mm. um, as much. Um, once the human being is able to come to terms because at the end of the day, in order to develop on your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beginning with the fitrah, when you're born, mm. all the way on your journey of ascent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of your, your, your own growth, um, you require a path, you require guidance, you require um, a means um, um, of how to achieve that. And that's of course manifest in the in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the in the in the in the best example set by the by the by the good companions of, of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at Tabi'in, etc. in the Islamic tradition. Um they, they chart a path, they provide a pathway on how to improve the self and refine it. And um it, this Islamic tradition is one of the richest in the world in terms of purification mm -hmm. of the nafs, in order to do what? in order to reactualize the purity of the ruh mm -hmm. that it once possessed. Wow. Right? So um, some scholars associate, you know, in the Quran, of course, there are um, three levels to the nafs. There's nafs al-amara yeah. which mm -hmm. is the lowest level. And nafs al-amara is basically the nafs or that part of ourself that is um, at the mercy of the lower instincts and mm -hmm. desires. Um, having instincts and designs is not a bad thing in the Islamic tradition. You mm -hmm. know, we're very much a culture that is um, pro-life. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the nafs al-amara is uh, when we are at the mercy of these instincts and designs and not able to control them. Mm -hmm. If we work upon ourselves and improve and refine ourselves, we are able to be at the level of a nafs al-lawama. A nafs al-lawama is the, 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 the self that takes to itself to account. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it reminds you, talum. You know, it reminds you. Uh, it takes you to account. Uh, there's an element of judgment. There's an element of um, cognitive, rational capacity to control and understand. Yes. That we're we're in partial control here. Mm -hmm. And above that, even is a nafs mutmainna. A nafs mutmainna is uh, the level of the self or the nafs where we have actualized a certain sense of peace and stillness mm -hmm. um, through iman. Of course, to taqwa, through taqwa. Um, and and the highest level of a nafs al mutmainna is touches a ruh. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you were to have a diagram mm -hmm. of the nafs, you'd say the ruh is at the top, mm -hmm. and then you have the three levels of the nafs, and then the body at the lowest. Right. And our journey through life really is a journey through an actualization of these various levels of ourself, mm -hmm. um, essentially. قد أفلح من زكاها. قد خاب من دسها. And and um, successful is the one who purifies this nafs. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And a lot of the Islamic tradition, all extracted from the Quran, it just systematizes it, structures mm -hmm. it a little bit, because in the Quran it's dispersed, uh, the wisdom and hikmah and the jewels are dispersed everywhere. Um, now this is our Islamic conception and understanding of the self. Um, the problem with modernity is. It tries to um, discover and chart the path of the self for its own development mm -hmm. on its own terms. That if you're at the level of a nafs al amara and you haven't yet seen the higher levels yet, how can you chart a path along to a destination you haven't seen, you haven't witnessed, mm -hmm. and you're not even considering anyone else to tell you about? Right? Uh, the, uh, the, this, the self on its own resources, cut off from God and cut off from the wisdom of tradition is not able to uh, properly understand what it is, and let alone chart a path of uh, liberation. If I could touch upon that point, yeah. Dr. Samir, that would lead on to my uh, question that I was just uh, thinking as, as you were explaining. I guess nowadays we live in an age where individual truth is used as a measure um, to justify what is morally right and what is morally wrong. I think that creates a, a big problem as well. And just as you were talking, I was writing some mm -hmm. things down, I guess, what implications does that have on a Muslim, on a Muslim's worldview, whereas you kind of obstructing the objective and now using your own subject, subjective morality as a measure for truth? Well, one of the hallmarks of modernity and more so post-modernity mm -hmm. is this idea that we are the authors or we have the capacity to define what is truth, yeah. what is good, mm -hmm. what is beautiful. Um, and that's the, that's the illusion. 
right? And it's catastrophic because our entire Islamic tradition is based on a very different understanding of what the self is. Mm -hmm. um, Allah Taala who created the self has told us about it and defined it for us. Um, and those who have received the prophetic revelation are the ones who have shown us the path of how to purify it. Um, uh, the error of individualism is it, it assumes that um, the individual can do that. And the only criteria it provides, because in Islamic tradition, our criteria is what? Revelation. Mm -hmm. It's Allah. It's the Sunnah. We align ourselves with something higher beyond ourselves, and we take that as the measure of truth. Um, if you don't have anything like that, your only measure of what to do is how is by turning inwards mm -hmm. and seeing how you feel about things. Hence, these kind of uh, the the danger of this kind of subject subjectivism or subjectivity, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that was highlighted as the only path of moving forward in Western individualism for centuries. You turn inward. If you, if you read Wordsworth, if you read Rousseau, if you read many of these authors who, um, sorry, what was the second author? Rousseau, okay. um, um, and many of the authors into you know uh, the influence of Freud on, on modern culture mm -hmm. and postmodern culture. Uh, the turn inward. Um, in order to uh, search within oneself for how one feels about something can hardly provide the kind of criteria, objective criteria mm -hmm. for whether what you're doing is right or wrong. Yeah. It's your nafs, it's your waswas, right? Um, so there's a fundamental problem there. Now in the Islamic tradition, alhamdulillah, we believe that the self is not what you make it out to be. You know, individualism will tell you you are what you make yourself to be. And especially this emerges by the 20th century with the birth of existentialism mm -hmm. with Sartre and others, that uh, you are what you want yourself to be. To be yeah. And that comes as a culmination of a long tradition of the turn inward towards subject. You're no subjective. longer created in the image of God. You are no. your own artist. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. That uh, The idea that we're image created in the image of God and that uh, Adam was given the, the, all the names mm -hmm. and, and somehow we have this elevated status mm -hmm. potentially to actualize this perfection is, is gone. Um, and so what ends up happening is um, uh, you end up in, an, in a, a dark inner subjective realm um, uh, closed in on itself. Right? One of the, um, one, a great scholar once said, um, the enlightenment and up until the early 20th century cut us off from above, mm. from God. You removed yourself from the garden as well. Yeah. I've read so and Freud opened, up, opened us up to the hell below, mm -hmm. right? Any, the hell, the darker subconscious realm of our inner desires mm -hmm. and our inner darkest instincts, right? So um, how do we navigate that? The Islamic tradition provides a very different model. Uh, the notion of the fitrah is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Islamic tradition, there is this idea that we aren't, we cannot define who we are entirely, mm -hmm. but we are created upon a certain nature. We are created upon a certain disposition, a primordial disposition, the fitrah. And if we veer off that path, we experience all sorts of psychological hells and misery and mm -hmm. pain. Hence the birth of many of the contemporary pathologies of the modern world, whether it's nihilism, alienation, psychosis, neurosis. Many of these have to do with um, this fundamental um, uh, shift and error uh, in by putting the great burden of defining what is, mm -hmm. what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is beautiful upon the individual. The individual, individual can't carry this burden. Mm -hmm. We're not made to carry this kind of burden. Um, hence the sense of loss, alienation, lack of meaning. I mean, nihilism is the lack of sense of meaning and purpose. Of meaning. And well, I guess you've also touched on a very important uh, topic there. I guess we're kind of pushed to this um, corner of darkness. I guess the world will kind of push you to a corner and it will ask you, and who you are, and if you don't know, I guess it will give you that meaning. But you've also talked about, for example, Sigmund Freud and um, other mo political movements as well. I guess my question to you would be, um, how can we navigate a space where we are, you know, we're, we're in the light of, how can I put this simply? We see a lot of Muslims nowadays at university, um, you know, aligning themselves either with the extreme left or the extreme right. And we can understand that a lot of these things that they put out that are very, I guess sympathetic, you can understand why Muslims would align themselves with that. For example, if you're not a rally, you have perhaps the communists or the LGBTQ movement joining your Palestinian rally and then you kind of attend theirs and you kind of say, it's okay, they attend ours, we attend theirs. That's how people kind of perceive it to be. But how do we navigate this space yet remain faithful to our own tradition without falling into the traps of modernity and all these? 
Essentially, practice. we need to do what you know we're doing at Soul Academy. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We, we, our our motto. Shameless <coughs> plug, but it's <laughs> respected. Yeah, I mean, our, our motto is Al Tajdid Al Muassal, right? Uh, renewed revival, mm-hmm. um, or rooted revival, sorry, rooted revival, which is the idea that any attempt to um, revive, obviously, we need to revive uh, our, our tradition, but uh, any revival has to be rooted. Uh, rooted in what? Rooted in the immutable classical principles of our tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm reminded, uh, a lot of the movements today remind me of the initial reaction of Muslim scholars um, when they first encountered modernity. Today we live in a postmodern age, so a lot of the movements you mentioned are quite postmodern. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, in the way in which Muslim intellectuals and Shi'u responded to the onslaught of modernity, you see that one of the things that characterizes their reaction, their response, and it was reactionary. Why? Because they didn't have time to digest the essence of what modernity was. Mm -hmm. Many of them superficially saw advancement in science and advancement in technology. And they naively thought that if you just adopted the science and technology, you can do whatever you wanted to do with it, you know. What they didn't realize is that embedded in the science and technology, um, and embedded in the very nature of the nation state, which we uh, took on board mm-hmm. or was imposed upon the Muslim world, were a whole set of assumptions, values, an entire worldview that comes with it. Mm-hmm. Um, unless we uh, are rooted in our Islamic tradition and its principles, and simultaneously are able to fundamentally and profoundly understand the essence of the modern world and the postmodern world. Uh, we're not going to be able to uh, chart an alternative mm-hmm. um, for the Muslim youth. Um, many Muslim youth, um, in the absence of a metaphysical yeah. tradition, a cosmological tradition, um, an intellectual tradition. We lack that, I think, especially yeah. in these kind of circles. In, in absence of being rooted in something like that, mm-hmm. um, they're not able to, uh, they're not equipped with the tools, mm-hmm. the intellectual resources, and the, the correct perspectives from which they then evaluate a lot of the ideas that they seem to be engaged with. What happens is they may come across a, a movement that emphasizes a question of justice. Yes. I mean, people fall into critical theory and exactly. gender theory, all these types of theories. You have. <laughs> How can, you know, it's quite uh, calamitous on the soul itself, as, it is. as you touched upon. It is. But where but, do you think that comes from? Is it this bruised sense of entitlement or what is it? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It comes from the fact that it addresses an important um issue, Mm -hmm. injustice. And um, while they're drawn to it because of the the fact that it's addressing this injustice and unmasking it, Mm -hmm. what they don't realize is um, they accept everything that comes with it. They kind of fall into the trap of it. In the process. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, our father and grandfather's generation when they imbibe Marxism, Mm -hmm. you know. Especially for the Arabs as as well. Especially, well, in the Arab world, yeah. I mean, they, you know, and they took this Marxist idea of Mm anti-capitalism, anti-colonialism, and um, against the injustices, yeah. and it took it on board with its entire worldview, right? It's profoundly problematic. Mm-hmm. Karl Marx has a, a, a number of good things to say, but uh, um, take it all on board mm-hmm. is profoundly problematic. Um, and it, it's the lack of the rootedness mm-hmm. of the people who did that. If you look at the late 19th, early 20th century, many scholars who were rooted in the classical tradition didn't fall prey to this error. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, they've been neglected. Mm-hmm. And we're actually organizing a conference this summer to I'm revive sure. interest in them, right? Classically trained scholars who uh, responded and critiqued modernity mm-hmm. in very interesting ways from a classical Kalam perspective, from a classical Kazakh perspective, from a classical Usul Fiqh perspective, mm-hmm. etc. Um, these youth, unless they root themselves once again in the classical tradition, mm-hmm. they won't have the correct tools and broad metaphysical framework within which to make sense mm-hmm. of all this. I remember I was a student in anthropology many years ago. I did my field work in the South Pacific. Um, and at some point, I decided to quit anthropology. At that point, although I had some traditional training with some shiur, it wasn't yet in the intellectual disciplines. Mm-hmm. It was in the basics, alum, hadith, and Quran. Um, and anthropology was insidiously, the, the perspectives of anthropology, because if you study anthropology long enough, it teaches you the absolute relativism of all cultures. Mm-hmm. You know, Moral right and wrong is just a cultural construct of some culture somewhere. Mm-hmm. And so it makes you question, well, where's the universal validity and objectivity of my own standing? Mm-hmm. So I quit it because I felt like it was beginning to disturb my soul. Um, it's only later after I studied the uh, mature uh, Islamic intellectual tradition 
that it gave me this framework within which now to appreciate anthropologies, limited and relative mm -hmm. truths and perspectives, and put them in their place, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's important. Many of these youth don't know where to put these perspectives because they don't have the broader framework, framework. and mesh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and so in the absence of that, um, they're just going to be drawn into one ideology after another, after another, be swept under the way. with very serious detrimental effects. And mm -hmm. we've seen that with many political movements. Kamal, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I feel like it's very important for us <coughs> as Muslims to have that framework, to have that guide, guidance and that, those guidelines because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like in the Quran, he, like, he, he condemns these people so many times. Like, do they have a book from which they discern right from wrong with? In another instance, we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, do you see the one who takes his desires as his God? Mm -hmm. And I feel like in today's day and age, we definitely see the, the main idol that's being worshipped is the self and the mm -hmm. individual self, the subjective self. And if we don't have that ability to, dis to discern right from wrong, it, we do definitely get swept under the tidal wave of postmodernism and everything that it has to offer. Another, I guess, common movement we're seeing rampant today is the rise of cancel culture. That's another movement, Definitely, the yeah. woke movement. And we're seeing a lot of Muslims, I guess, adopt this framework. We're mm -hmm. seeing them use this framework to like, I guess, insidiously tarnish the reputation of different mashaykh, different scholars. They've taken this movement on board and they don't have that Islamic framework to navigate right from wrong. Because perhaps there are some, you know, aspects of cancel culture that we are sympathetic towards, calling out wrongdoing. But then when we don't understand the entire framework mm -hmm. of Islam and we adopt <coughs> the entire framework of cancel culture instead, then we see a, a recipe for disaster. Do, do, you, do, you, do you see that where I'm coming from? Do you absolutely, feel that? Absolutely. And uh, as Muslims, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't necessarily be get bogged down in taking sides with these. These, mm -hmm. these. A lot of these issues, in my opinion, you can clearly document and chart how we got to the point today mm -hmm. where a statement like, I'm confused about my gender, makes sense. Definitely. Makes sense, yani, not makes sense from a Islamic <coughs> perspective, mm -hmm. makes sense in, in, you know, in contemporary culture. Um, but if you look at the, the, the steps taken from individualism, subjectivity, Freud, sexualization of identity, mm -hmm. and wedding that to uh, left-wing um, politics, politics, the inevitable result is, is, is woke cancel culture mm -hmm. and this whole uh, gender confusion gender because fluidness. once you yeah once you separate once you once you uh, d um, define or once you say that the human being uh, subjective um, ideas and feelings defines what you are not your fitra mm -hmm. not an essential nature what you decide it is automatically what you're doing is you now you're, you're severing the relationship between any intrinsic essence that you have mm -hmm. any intrinsic um, um, uh, nature to your body mm -hmm. and what you feel it may be. Mm -hmm. And with Simone de Beauvoir and Sartre plus Freud, you get separating what the body is, mm -hmm. your sexuality, mm -hmm. from what you may or may not think you are, gender. The severance, this final severance that happened mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s, is the direct result of that is, you know, I am the gender I define myself to be. Mm -hmm. As I feel. Yeah, and feel, why? Because what I feel and what I think I am is ultimately what defines what I am. There's no essence to me. Yeah. Um, and the fact that I'm in this body, you know, with the masculine or feminine features is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And you can chart that kind of development, how we got here. And every step of the way is, uh, is, is as absurd as the one before it. Mm -hmm. From an Islamic perspective, the point of departure was mistaken and every other step after that can be easily critiqued. Mm -hmm. it, we don't need to fall into that kind of debate and discussion. Um, we do need to engage at some level now because too many Muslims are involved in it. Mm. But I think a lot of our energy should go towards uh, offering an alternative. Mm. Um, uh, Muslims aren't yet offering humanity an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, we're neither left nor right. Okay? There are certain aspects of the left that some Muslims might find appealing to their sensibility, sense of justice. Um, there are certain things about the right in terms of its maybe its values, conservatism, that, its conservative nature, the but family. We neither this nor that, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and getting too bogged down in these is is, is problematic. Mm -hmm. It yeah. comes back to like, it doesn't matter. Anyone can say truth. You know, even the shaitan can say truth. In in the famous hadith, we see 
صدق وهو كذوب you know the shaytan spoke the truth but he's a liar mm. so not it doesn't matter who is saying Spam. what so many a time muslims will feel like no we have to side with the left or we have to side with the right how can you side with the left when you know or how can you side with the right when they're islamophobes we're not here to side with the left nor the right we're here to stand up for our principles if our principles somewhat happen to align then okay but we're not going to be tied down to this movement um doctor there is another uh hallmark of postmodernism that i feel is very important for us to uh, draw upon and that is the severance between our connection our i guess fitra our mm. our bodies with the natural world mm. you know in the postmodern era we find ourselves in today there's a heavy <coughs> reliance on technology consumerism um we're we're in like the uber eats generation where everything is streamlined towards us we are extremely privileged and we have this uh, disconnect between the human body and the natural world what implications does that have on our fitra or our relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's huge implications mm. it, it inhibits um the fitra the fitra is um if you go back to uh, trying to understand what the fitra actually is it's it's a it's a remarkable dimension of our being where we come into this world already predisposed towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm-hmm. we already studies pre- that show that children I yeah think justin barrett was the one who said that children have that innate belief in allah or god absolutely the creator absolutely an uh, innate, innate predisposition toward allah an innate predisposition towards uh, the good um that has to be nurtured mm-hmm. that's why at a certain age the fitra can be covered over you know mm-hmm. your parents make you a christian or a majoor or etc mm-hmm. according to hadith and so um but the fitra is also um uh, a more primordial natural way of being if you remember the hadith in in the in the story of the miraj where the prophet sallallahu was offered two cups a cup of wine a cup of mm-hmm. of leaven like milk. milk like milk um he chose um uh, the milk and um if uh, and 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 if you if you think about it you know wine is often associated with christianity right um it's fermented it's an artificial yes. drink that mm-hmm. had to go through a number of artificial processes in order to become the, the drink that it actually is whereas milk is naturally sustaining in its natural form mm-hmm. right so islam is that return to the primordial fitra uh, that underpins all human beings and our human nature and if you look at every aspect of our tradition um if you look at the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you look at our ibadat they're all closely wedded to primordial patterns uh, of nature whether it's the movement of the sun across the sky that determines the prayer times the movement of um, the moon you know and our fasting and so the movement of the sun and and the planets and the, and the spheres is not just a random blob of mm-hmm. material substances moving around in space accidents in space. no <laughs> yeah. i mean they're literally manifestations mm-hmm. of divine actions and movements and so what better way um than to have our own way of life mm. aligned and attuned mm. to the divine rhythm in the cosmos um and the movements of prayer for example um align themselves well with the movements of nature mm. um we you know we perform ablution with natural water um we recite our quran with a very primordial sounding words and we're oriented towards a certain uh, direction etc um every aspect of our life the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is fitraik mm-hmm. fitraik in the latter days of human history allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is returning us back to the primordial fitrah um and so if we follow the sunnah the sunnah is like a protection it's a way of life in the midst of the modern world that keeps us very close to the rhythms of nature and closely aligned to it mm-hmm. if muslims stick to that mm-hmm. they will never sever the relationship to, na- to nature and this is why and this is i'm going to say something that may sound a bit controversial but yeah. i'm going to by all means this is the most controversial <laughs> podcast <I'm joking>. um, <laughs> if our ulama and our, our ulama need to take into account the particular moment that we find ourselves in human history mm-hmm. so utterly disconnected from the natural world so utterly connected from the rhythms of nature so utterly out of tune with other modalities of time other than this mm-hmm. that we should be encouraged to look and determine the prayer times by looking outside the window wow not i'm not saying don't look We've at got the clock. apps the yeah. apps just the apps 
our relationship to nature should never be mediated. Mm. Full stop. Wow. Right? I'm not against technology. I'm not a Luddite mm-hmm. by any stretch of the imagination. You know, the 19th century Luddites went out, went around destroying machines and, and you know, yeah. and industry. No, and not, not, not about <laughs> that. But the say. <laughs> it seems to be colonizing every aspect of our life. And we have yes, to draw a line. Definitely. We have to draw a line. And the line is, in my, so far as I'm concerned, is when it begins to intruding on our relationship to Allah mm. and our relationship to divine actions in nature, the natural world. Um, a Muslim is the last person on the planet whose natural way of life echoes the primordial way of life of primordial man in the beginning of times of history. The Muslim should be the last person who shouldn't look out the window. Right? Mm. Or when Ramadan comes, we shouldn't go up onto the roof mm. to sight the moon with the eye. Allah. I'm not saying the fatwa or the decision on when Ramadan happens has to be determined exclusively by looking at the moon. Mm-hmm. That's something for shiuch to, to work out. Mm-hmm. I'm saying as a people, as Muslims. Um, Even the feeling, the feeling you get can just you imagine, by looking at the Can you the imagine moon? the ummah, yeah. um, the night before Ramadan, turning off the lights and two billion Muslims standing on the rooftops. Allah. Right, looking for the sign of Allah. Allah. Can you imagine, I mean, that image? After you mentioned to the people uh, at work over here, I said, you know, the moon that you look at is the same moon that the Prophet looked at. Absolutely, Connected absolutely. Connected. Looking out at the sun and trying to determine the prayer time and then, and then correcting it, mm-hmm. then correcting it by looking at your watch. But if my first relationship to the rhythms of nature are mediated, mm. I'm completely severed from nature. And that's deeply and profoundly problematic. It may not have been an issue, uh, 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 you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, to purely determine prayer times or whatever it is through some kind of astronomical calculation, mm-hmm. right? Because we were so embedded in the natural rhythms, it wasn't an issue. But now it's become an existential question mm-hmm. of survival. Our own sanity depends on the extent to which our own relationship to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala still depends on the extent to which we maintain this relationship. Um, and so uh, it, it's it's very important. So prayer times. Um, the orientation thing. of the Qibla. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember I read in a book many Facing years ago. Facing West in Australia. In Australia. Yeah, so. I mean, look, getting your bearings and knowing East, West, North, South is an important is important part of our mental health. Mm-hmm. Psychologists have proven this. Wow. Knowing where the sun is, knowing north, south, east, west, your basic directions, um, uh, where the wind currents are coming from. These are primordial aspects of you know being attuned to the, the natural world. Um, there's nothing wrong with orienting yourself and trying to find the Qibla and then looking at the, the app to determine whether you got it right or wrong, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, I would even go far as to say, you know, forget about the app. Um, uh, I, 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 I've known you have said that um, Ishtihad in this particular moment, if there's a group of people mm-hmm. and their kind of Ishtihad is overlap in that kind of a certain direction, that is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, because the act of searching for the Qibla itself Whereby you're orienting your heart towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a ibadah. Wow. Right? That's huge. It's fun. The For moment you decide. Like turn. Like absolutely. That's ibadah. Where well. are you turning? You're turning to yeah. Allah. You're not turning to the, Allah. To the Kaaba. Mm-hmm. You know? What did Omar say about the Kaaba? You know, I, or the stone, black stone. I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kiss you. I'm exactly. kissing you. I'm not doing it for your own sake. Um, orientation to the Kaaba in the Islamic tradition is uh, a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, because we need a certain direction to turn towards Allah mm-hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so out of mercy and compassion for us, he has given us the direction of l- 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 um, the holy house. You spoke at the beginning of the podcast about being therapists in this age. And in today's age, we're seeing postmodernism pr- present a crisis to humanity. Another crisis is the crisis of nihilism. Nothing carries meaning. And we're seeing rampant depression, anxiety. How can we take these, I guess, concepts within postmodernism and present them the Islamic solution. I know you're going there, just needed to present the question. How do we present ourselves as therapists in this regard? I think we need to start um, rooted in our own tradition. Mm-hmm. We need to start engaging with the issues and concerns that trouble the modern world. Mm-hmm. A lot of our discourse is insular, mm-hmm. you know, to other Muslims. Amongst each other. Amongst each other. It needs to, it, we need to go back to the Quranic Ayyuhan Nas, right? That's our oh, people. Islamic message is, oh people, right? Um, because what is desperately needed today is an alternative for humanity. Uh, unless we can help rectify things at a global level um, or um, 
it, among communities outside the Muslim community. Um, you, there's not much you can solve exclusively within the Muslim community. It's a global issue. And given that Islam um, is essentially a this universal dispensation, we're not carrying the the message in the way we're supposed to, right? Mm. We, we have to stop saying postmodernism is a Western problem, right? Mm. It's a global problem. It's everyone's problem now. Muslims themselves are highly affected by postmodernism. We, are. we can't there deny are, it. There are very few away. Muslims today who are traditional through and through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the moment they're born until the, we're modern, postmodern, um, and we have to come to terms with that. But in the process, what we're trying to resolve and what we're, we're trying to address is uh, out of this kind of Islamic universal compassion, or Ma'a Sanaka al Rahmat al Alameen, Prophet was sent as a compassion to humanity. Compassion is a very important principle in the Quran. Al Rahman al Arsh Istawa, Mush al Jabbar. Yes. <laughs> There's a reason the for that. Merciful. The merciful, the compassionate one. Why? Because the governing property of existence is compassion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need creation. Mm. Out of compassion, he brings forth mm. things into being. And we came uh, into this world for mercy as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, al-Rahman um, uh, al-Ladina al ardi hawnan, right? Um, this, we need to go back to embodying this quality and attribute of compassion, which is embodied in the Prophet sallam and his sunnah. Mm -hmm. um, and it begin it will get, begin to radiate out into everything we do the primordial sunnah the sunnah of the prophet the, the amazing thing about islamic sharia and the sunnah of the prophet is unlike some other religious traditions where there's a lot of artificial do's and don'ts mm -hmm. and it's constructed by the human mind the sharia which means the path to a watering hole um, consists of guides guidelines or guidance that reorients us to being what we are intrinsically created for. It's very natural, you know? Mm. Um, I'll give an example I've uh, given uh, before, um, uh, just, just an example of how primordial it is. And, 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 and this, this touches on the, the point of how we can, uh, if all human beings, as the Quran teaches us, um, are born with the fitrah. The, fit, the fitrah is never completely um, extinguished in every human being. And so all human beings have a common ground and we as Muslims need to work on that common ground that we have in order to reach out to others. Um, I was sitting in a restaurant in Granada with a de German delegation and they served uh, meat and all sorts of different foods and whatnot. And I, I decided to have um, the salad vegetables and whatnot especially you know in granada they have these um they have this tradition which is unfortunate where many of the restaurants still hang pork mm. and they serve a lot of pork because of uh, it was in response to the muslim presence <coughs> in the city yeah. but anyway so um um so i was very careful um very careful about how they cook the food the food where anyway i was asking all these questions so as we started eating um the german delegation began asking me you know why aren't you eating meat I said to them, you know, personal, philosophical, ethical reasons. <laughs> that's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so they asked me, so what are the reasons? I said to them, well, you know, I mean, um, I really got to make sure that, yeah, that the animal was treated well and well fed when it was mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to I wanna make sure it was frolicking around in a paddock somewhere, <laughs> not in a cage, <laughs> right? Um, I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's important. I think that's really interesting. And, I, and then they said, well, go on. Any other reasons? I said, well, I mean, I got to make sure that the, that the animal was killed with the most minimal pain. Mm. You know, I mean, you can't kill animals in an industrial complex manner. And they said, oh, yeah, that's, 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 you know, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm really intrigued. And so at this moment, they're, drawn, the other, in. Hmm? they're drawn into. Drawn in. They're drawn in. Yeah. At this moment, other members just put their knives down and began listening in. Um, and they, they asked, you know, so go on. I said, um, well, you know, I think, I mean, we have no intrinsic right to kill these animals. Um, so I, I like to invoke a cosmic compassion <laughs> to put myself in a state <laughs> of compassion when killing this animal. Mm. It's only right to do so. And, and, and they're like, wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> I never saw it that way. And uh, I, I, you know, I really love that philosophy. And I said to them, that's what we Muslims call halal. Yeah. In and a nutshell. The, 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 the kind of the jaws just dropped. Like, and they said to me, we've never heard 
So that's what halal means. I said, mm. well, essentially, that's what halal meat is, right? Um, and they said, and they said. Uh, so in my mind, I could have gone about this in a very different way. I could have said, it's not halal. I don't eat it. Thereby invoking my right as a minority to separate dietary laws. Mm. When in fact, what I should have been doing, and what I did do, is invoking our common, primordial, um, ethical principles for not eating meat you see the difference yes muslims today are too caught up in 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 demanding what is rightfully theirs as a minority and we've forgotten that um our whole tradition is not based on the rights of a minority it's based on the right of a human being it's based on the right of the khalifa it's based on the right of what is intrinsically natural to do if you take halal if you take every aspect of our sharia right it's perfectly attuned to the nature of what is perfectly attuned to the primordial way of being. Mm -hmm. And if we articulate it this way, no person in their right mind, except a Lahabite, mm -hmm. you know, um, <laughs> who has some pernicious intrinsic hatred of the truth, mm -hmm. right? Everyone else will, will, will find it appealing, except for someone who's, you know, hell bent yeah. on fighting the truth and Allah, and, you know, mm -hmm. and those category of people do exist, right? So not all people are uh, Islamophobic because they hate Islam. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding involved and you can really um so if we start articulating our sharia as part of a universal human conversation about what is better for us as human beings um i think you'll get a much more interesting conversation you know um and what sacred text has more references to the natural world than the quran right? um again you mentioned nature right um, our whole tradition is rooted in the natural world and if you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet I was giving a talk at a school, Islamic school, about two years ago here, and I was pointing out the number of um, uh, himas, mm. uh, natural reserves set up by the Prophet and the Sahaba immediately afterwards. As whenever they entered into a city like Medina and whatnot, um, students were surprised to, when they looked at the conditions of the hima, mm. what you could and couldn't do. Um, they were, they were, I asked them, how many of us here in Australia, how many of you volunteer with the natural reserves in Sydney. I would be surprised to see any hands up. That's that's a natural extension of the sunnah, no? Mm. Um, there's a sunnaic practice being hap well, happening already. Of course, there's one condition that's not in a natural reserve, which is that this um, is set aside for Allah SWT, um, which is an important condition. Um, but everything else, all the other conditions are met, mm. right? Um, uh, why? Because we see this as a Western practice and it's the, unfortunately you hear them, this is a kufar society and all that nonsense. And it's a very, very uh, pathological way of looking looking at things. Yeah, I think yeah. Positioning, our, positioning ourselves as therapists to many of the modern plagues that are happening today is crucial. Connecting with nature, I think that's a common common mm. ground. People will have that respect, yeah. as you mentioned. Even the People. arts as well, because if from my understanding, sorry to cut you yeah. off, Kamal, um, is that with poets, I think poets were described as, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Poets were described as psychologists as well, because what they would say, oh. it was an understanding through what they would write and the great writings they would write. That is mm. an, also a form of therapy as well. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the notion of the arts, um, we, we shouldn't, we should be designing our Islamic structures and buildings mm -hmm. with an eye for creating spaces that instill the very principles we want people to live by, mm -hmm. right? Peace, harmony. Iman and aman are words that are rooted, right? Um, Sakan and sakina, to dwell, to live, and sakina, that primordial peace that Allah yeah. brings down. These, our buildings should be places of sakina, they should be places of aman, they should be places of tranquility and peace. Um, you shouldn't have to, like I've done many years, fight with uncles and mosques. <laughs> To, to design the wudu areas properly, mm -hmm. you know, it shouldn't stink and shouldn't smell. Wudu, according to some opinions, is a form of ibadah mm -hmm. mustaqillah. It's a form of worship, right? Mm -hmm. It's the you're purifying your body and simultaneously your heart in order to turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala exclusively mm -hmm. in a bathroom that stinks yeah. with the wrong kind of material that's molding, with water coming out of the right, right wrong kind of faucets. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kamal's been, I think. We've all had our fair share with uncles in the mosque. Water is a sacred substance. Yeah, definitely. Right? It has to be treated with dignity, with mm -hmm. respect. 100%. Um, not come out of a plastic or, I don't know, I mean, I always 
uh, advocate copper um, or some other really important material um, and the use of clay as much as possible in the wudu areas, uh, wudu areas that have excellent ventilation, that are properly designed, not an afterthought of the engineer or the architect mm-hmm. stuck away somewhere in the car park. Definitely. Right? Um, beauty of our structures, our mosques, where are the gardens? You know, in the modern world where that are consist of urban jungles, our mosques should be sanctuaries, mm-hmm. natural sanctuaries with gardens that Muslims and non-Muslims are drawn to. But then beyond the trees, they see the, the hall of the mosque and the prayer, mm-hmm. and they hear the primordial call to prayer. Mm-hmm. That's dawah. In essence, when we immerse ourselves in nature, the amount of times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives references to nature in the Quran. There's a plethora of, of ayat and, and, and verses where, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he directs our vision towards nature. But essentially, what's the purpose? To guide us to Allah. Because mm-hmm. all these things Absolutely. are called ayat, mm-hmm. signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, uh, definitely something which is very important for us to implement in our da'wah today. Um, moving forward, uh, Doctor, in, in light of all these conversations, in light of all these issues that we have raised, seclusion versus engagement, what's the best methodology for the modern Muslim today? I guess both, uh, both avenues do have their weight in our tradition. Mm-hmm. What, what is the best course of action? What Should practical methods seclude? could we, yeah. well, I, I'm guessing I definitely sense a, a, a pro-engagement. Uh, Look, I think, uh, I think it's- That's interesting because I'm kind of seeing the bit of, bit of the opposite, yeah. so that's interesting. I mean, we don't have to really uh, s- uh, struggle over this. The, the Sunnah yeah. provides the answer to it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very clear, you know. Uh, there are no Rahbaniyah in Islam. There's no complete seclusion, isolation in that mm-hmm. sense. Um, the prophetic Sunnah was um, maybe short temporary periods of seclusion after which there was some serious engagement. Mm. The greatest seclusion, the greatest spiritual journey was the Mi'raj after which he came back and engaged with the community. Uh, or Ghar Hira, you know, he would mm-hmm. spend, uh, before prophecy at least, he spent a significant amount of time up there and his wife Khadija would bring him food halfway up the mountain. But after that, he didn't spend significant amounts of time, months on end, isolated from the community. Mm-hmm. Um, he would engage in Khalwa and Iqama, etc. So I think it, it also depends on various moments and periods uh, in your life. We live in a period today where um, we're so overly socialized that we do need the occasional retreat and seclusion in order to regain some kind of um, uh, sanity and peace and mm-hmm. tranquility. Mm-hmm. Remember Ghazali's life provides an example of this. Yeah, you know, ten years. He, he went through his, you know, a great crisis and mm-hmm. ten years. It wasn't seclusion. It was siyaha. Um He did meet people. Traveling. Yeah. He, so he traveled for in search of knowledge mm-hmm. and in search of meeting the awliya, meeting scholars, etc. And uh, he was partly secluded and partly engaged with a few handful of people. But after this period was over, he went back to teaching. Not at his Harvard of its time, mm-hmm. uh, the Nizamiya, but he created a, he went back to a madrasa, which he set up in a Hanaka, where he, he, he taught a select number of students. Um, so I would say a combination of, of both at various moments and periods of one's life, particularly when it doesn't affect um, and affect too much your duties and responsibilities towards others. You know, if you have a, you're a single child and you have a mother and father who are elderly and you decide to go on siyaha and you leave them on their own, mm. it, it's problematic. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've, I think that answer was a good answer. I think we found the Mizan. I think Kamal and I were still the at a opposite, that he was thinking more in, I was more out, I was thinking more in, but I think we've kind of found mm. that. On a weekly basis, yeah. you can balance mm-hmm. between them. You know, if you go all day without I mean, other than your prayer times, we all need moments of stillness and tranquility on a daily basis. And you know from experience, especially if you're married with kids, that if you go on I can't for a speak, week or two, unfortunately. <laughs> soon, inshallah. Yeah. Or maybe perhaps I join the club. Enjoy that time, I guess. Yeah, enjoy <laughs> enjoy time. your time. Uh, enjoy your bachelor's life uh, while it lasts. Um, because uh, it'll be very difficult, mm. you know, but those moments are important. And uh, uh, the greatest kind of spiritual insights and experiences happen during those moments mm-hmm. and it's not just you know if you're if you're uh, picking up your whatsapp messages every every time the, the, the phone buzzes that's not going to work mm. you need extended periods of time i used to tell my students often 
I used to run um, educational trips and tours to Italy a lot. Um, high-end educational and spiritual May uh, I ask journeys. you why Italy? Italy seems like out of all the places, Italy mm. is kind um, of a... Uh, a convergence of, 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 of factors and, and uh, it's a place one of the few places in the world where you get um, the most exquisite beauty of nature mm-hmm. combined with the most exquisite beauty of urban form mm-hmm. very few places in the world and not just one or two places every single city in Italy is like that so anyway that's, that's another issue um, it's got a unique combination of factors and um, but um, it takes up to when you're traveling, it takes up to five, six days for you to remove yourself from the mental, psychological uh, habits of where you were, mm-hmm. let's say in Sydney, your daily routine. Um, and after the seventh day, begin to experience something different. Uh, right? Seven days. Yeah. People go on five day trips. Mm. I, I don't know how they do it. If that's not. That's not a that's not a, a proper see right? Mm. Um, it takes several days, right? It, it, our body, our mind, our heart has a certain logic to it that we need to follow. Um, uh, I remember I used to ask a student to sit in a piazza uh, at the end of every day for half an hour um, and allow the experiences of the day to sediment and settle. That half an hour extended their experience of the day by several hours. Right? Uh. The day seemed much, much longer and the experience is much, much deeper, mm. right? Again, uh, taking time to take in the experiences. If you're rushing around, checking messages, even on a retreat, that's pointless. Mm. Um, it, we're not built that way, right? So we need ex- extended period of time where we're doing nothing, right? Uh, but in that nothing, we're not literally doing nothing, you know? Contemplation is not a physical action necessarily, um, but it's the most profound movement of the soul. Mm. Right? And it can only happen in a moment of stillness. Well, thank you, Dr. Samir, um, uh, for joining us. We've had a, a riveting conversation. I know I've learned a lot from this and, and I'm sure I'm going to go back and take some notes on this myself as I wasn't able to do as much as I could as as uh, navigate this conversation. And to the viewers at home, if you'd like to have more of these conversations or to hear more of these conversations, please you know, do like the video, please subscribe and uh, hit the bell for notifications as well, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time.